My name is Steve Tauber. Uh, I have a company called Future Branch Development. And I also am a project manager at 3Coder here in Zagreb. You may have heard of them before. And I've also built a dating app for geeks called Cuddly. And I have a bunch of stickers and t-shirts and things like that. So if you, uh, you can come up at the end and grab some stickers. Or if you have good questions, we have some t-shirts for you. So. OK, so what is this talk about? This talk is about how to structure your, your communication as a programmer when working with clients. And uh, I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that. And also, when things go wrong, how to recover from that. This talk is not about, as an introverted person, I need to talk to someone, or I'm a programmer, and I need to use technical terms and how to do that. So it's mainly uh, a talk about the structure of communication. So what's in it for me? Well, if you're here to listen to this talk, some of the things I promise are uh, you will be at an advantage to build things once rather than rebuild things. You will give better estimates when your managers ask for estimates. And hopefully, you'll be happier. So let's see if I can actually keep my promise on those three things. So how is this possible? I'm going to start with a story. America's favorite. Uh, Holiday is coming up, Halloween. So I hope all of you have your costumes already finished and already ready. Uh, this is the first one I thought of. Maybe I should go as someone from Harry Potter. Or maybe, I, I know, Ghostbusters just came out. I'll be a Ghostbuster, right? <laughs> and then it occurred to me, there's a much better costume. I should be a Croatian hipster. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, this is an American folk hero called Paul Bunyan. He's a lumberjack, and he's really tall. This is a statue in Portland, Oregon, and it's nine and a half meters tall. So this is pretty good, right? All I need is my Croatian football jersey, a blue hat, some jeans, and wait a minute, there's a problem. He's got this really big ax, so I said to myself, I need an ax. Luckily, my girlfriend's family is from Karlovac, and her father has a huge... Uh, woodworking part of their house, and he's got all these different tools, so they have an axe. So I tell her, I need an axe, I need an axe. And she calls up her dad, and he says, okay, but axes are dangerous, and you guys will be drinking, this is not good. So I'll make you an axe, I'll make you a prop axe. So he goes and he starts making the axe, he looks up drawings on the internet. Well, this is what he had in mind. Can you guess which one? There's many different types of axes. He wanted to make the one on the left, but this isn't what I asked for. Who's heard that before? After they've built something, right? So this is the ax I want. Sad face. So what can we do? If we had structured our request better, if we had structured our feature better, maybe I would have gotten what I wanted. So what can I do? As a developer, uh, we can formulate our language in a certain way, in a certain structure, so that it's very clear to both the requester and the person fulfilling the request that it's uh, something very concrete, and we can accurately say, yes, we've, we've fulfilled this request. So I'm going to give you a real-life example. In the development world, a manager comes to you or a client comes to you and say, we need the cookie thing. And of course, you know, it's after lunch. You're like, I, I really am hungry, but... They're not talking about food. They're talking about this cookie thing at the bottom of the screen. You know, they have the on all the European websites. So, so we need to build this, and we take a look. And what do we need? Well, we need copy text. We need an icon. We need some sort of link to change settings, and we also need a way to close it. That's it, right? We'll build those three things, and we're good to go. But we forgot. What happens on the second visit to the site? Should we store the settings somehow? What if you can disable it? This button says change settings. It doesn't say more info. So there are things that maybe we didn't think of. One of the ways that we can figure out this list of what we need to do is use something called acceptance criteria. And acceptance criteria are a list of true and false statements. And you can just walk through them and determine, yes, I did this. Yes, I did this. Yes, I did this. And there's two types of acceptance criteria, functional and non-functional. Functional is about what the thing does, 
and non-functional is about what the thing is. And a subsection of the non-functional is operational, things like stability, portability, reliability, all of your illities and itties. So let's dig deep into these functional criteria. Uh, these are some samples of functional criteria for this cookie feature. So we have them in one format. The system shall do, and that's, uh, you can replace the underlying language here. So the system shall display a cookie to the user or notify the user that a cookie is going to be used. Another example, a user sees a pop-up about cookies when they visit the site. Okay? We can really easily evaluate if this is true or not. And the third thing is the pop-up can be closed by the user. So this is, again, something that the system does or will do. And we can evaluate them one by one. Some examples of non-functional criteria for this feature might be the system shall be, so it's be instead of do. And an example is the pop-up matches our site design. So that's something that just is a property of this feature that we're going to add. Here's an example of uh, reliability or speed. So for 95% of visitors, the cookie pop-up loads within one second. Okay? So this is something that the system uh, has inherently as a property of itself. So these are non-functional. Uh, another example, the implementation is portable to our Spanish website. Okay? So this seems pretty straightforward, but there are pitfalls. So where can this go wrong? The first is that if you have a statement that's not a true or false statement, something that you can't evaluate easily like that. Uh, another example is subjective. It looks nice, and you might hear this uh, usually from managers or people on the board. They'll say, oh, I'll, I'll know when I see it. I'll know when it's ready. But this is not something that will be useful to you to implement because there's no definition of done. Uh, oftentimes, our uh, acceptance criteria might be too technical or too complex. So this is something where uh, anyone should be able to really come in and evaluate the true and false nature of the statement. And finally, another pitfall is missing non-functional uh, criteria. So we oftentimes focus on what the thing does, and we forget about what it is. So as programmers, this is very easy to do, especially if you're a back-end programmer, you might forget there's an actual user experience here. So contemplate this before you start building, and you will see fewer returns on your feature coming back to you to rebuild. Next, we'll move to user stories. User stories are oftentimes coupled with acceptance criteria, and you'll know this if you're an agile developer. They're formatted like this. As a role, I can do something so that I gain a benefit. And the most important part of this statement, I think, is the final line, because if you understand why someone is requesting a feature, you can make certain assumptions about it. Be aware that you're making those assumptions, but you can understand certain uh, reasons for it and why might they ask it and therefore make an educated decision about uh, how it should be built. So let's fill this in. As a user, I can disable cookies so that I can browse in privacy. Pretty straightforward. And again, this will oftentimes be paired with acceptance criteria. Where are the pitfalls? Well. We have no real uh, benefit. So for an example, as a user, I close the pop-up so that I don't have to look at it. Well, that's not really the real reason why someone's closing it. It's because they don't want to interact with it or it's blocking portion of the screen. So sometimes your benefit might not be the true benefit. So be aware of that. Another example is if you have a convenient role, such as, as a dev, I can easily port the code. Well, a developer doesn't use the system, they build the system. Uh, you might be tempted to say, as a project owner, I do X, Y, Z. You want to keep the roles as actual users of the system, so as a user, as a logged-in user, as an administrator. And sometimes your user stories are too big. These are called epics. And you want your user stories to be doable usually within a day. So for instance, if someone came to you and said, build an authentication system, this is a massive task. And you want to actually split this up into 
As a user, I can log into the system. As a user, I can recover my password. As a user, I can use two-factor authentication. So what you want to do is take your user stories and break them down to a very granular level. The upgrade, I would say, to user stories is use cases. And use cases are, uh, they're very technical, they're very formal, they're very clearly defined, they're extensive, lots of words, they're well formatted in a very specific format, and they uh, can often show additional information such as prerequisites or extensions, exceptions, alternate flows, stakeholders, many, many, many more uh, features, many more information about what you're actually building. So I'm going to show you a wall of text. And this is a sample use case. And I, I, I don't want you really to read it, but just to see that it's very different in size from a user story. So here it is now. This is a sample of the user can disable cookies. And you can see that it's a much bigger, more complex uh, language. So uh, where are the pitfalls in use cases? Well, we have uh, not enough user focus. So sometimes we like to really dig into the system as engineers, and we forget about that someone's actually using the system. And it's very easy to do this with use cases, and the reason is because the system is one of the actors, and you have to write on behalf of the system. So you might say, as a user, I uh, enter my PIN code. And then you might say, the system will check the PIN code, and the system will do A, B, C, D. And then you have this long, long list of things that the system is doing. Additionally, there are times where you add too much technical information. And this is really easy for us to do, uh, again, as engineers, where we make decisions about how we're going to implement something while we're still in the planning phase. And really what you want to do is, if you're making assumptions or if you're going to actually make technical decisions, communicate that outside of your requirements documentation. Maybe you have a second document which details how to actually do the implementation. And the reason is because you don't want to bog down the, the actual working property of what you're building when you're just trying to describe it to a layperson. Uh, use cases have many, many optional fields you can add, and many times they can become very, very long. We have some use cases that are uh, maybe a page long, and then the extensions can easily take up two or three pages. So you don't want to do this. You want to keep things very tightly defined, and uh, you can actually refer to other use cases. So it's important to have that uh, cross-linking so you're not repeating yourself, just like you don't repeat yourself with your code. Another pitfall is describing the user experience. We're oftentimes describing these features before someone from our UX team has looked at it, so it's important that we're not saying the user will click on a button to disable change settings. Uh, maybe there's... Uh, another way that you don't know about that the UX designer has decided, oh, they can send some code or scan something and that will actually do what we want to do. So you don't know if the interface will be a button or a drop down or, or some other method. So we want to succeed in building this product, but we still want flexibility. So we shouldn't describe the user experience. So now we have three ways to communicate with our clients. We have acceptance criteria, we have our user stories, we have our use cases. And we're making money, right? Everyone's happy, everything's great, and the client's happy, and they call us up one day, and we're excited to answer the phone because they love us, and they say, what about mobile? Ah, we forgot about mobile. We forgot about this in our feature. So it is inevitable that you will miss something when you are when you're working on your features. It's just the nature of our work. So you can't get everything correct. You can't get everything right. Even if you have approved requirements docs with signatures on the bottom of every single page, 
if you have you know, thousands of pages of uh, use cases, if you have user stories and acceptance criteria for everything. So what can we do? Well, when things go wrong, one option is just to not answer the phone. But the, the real thing we should do is we should ask, what language do you speak? And I'm not talking about Croatian or German or Italian or English. I'm talking about languages of apology. So there's a guy named Gary Chapman, and he wrote a famous book called The, Le the Love Languages, and some of you might have heard of them. These are like five ways you communicate your love to people. Well, he also wrote a lesser-known book called The Languages of Apology. And he talks about how to say you're sorry to someone, essentially. How do you apologize? And usually if you listen, people will tell you how you should apologize. So let's look at these five things here. The first is express regret. And people will, the, the way that you achieve this is you just simply say, I'm sorry. And some people, I'm sure you've been in fights before, and your person you're fighting with might say, you didn't even say you're sorry. And they're telling you right then and there, their language of apology is expressing regret. They want to hear you express regret. Uh, another is accept responsibility. So this is simple as saying, I made a mistake. Just owning the fact that you made a mistake is important to some people. Another thing you can do is make restitution. So this is very common in customer service. Uh, many times uh, people call up tech support and they'll say, my internet was out for one hour. What are you going to do? How are you going to make this right? And what they're really looking for is they want to hear you make restitution. Maybe you can offer a payment. Maybe their next feature is free if you're doing an implementation. The fourth is change behavior. And for me, this is what I want to see is, I want you to know that there was a mistake and I want to hear how it won't happen again. So what steps will you take to make sure that the future doesn't repeat itself? that we are not making the same mistakes over and over again. So this is uh, the fourth, and the fifth being request forgiveness. So uh, this is, uh, there's a subtle nuance here, and it's we shouldn't demand forgiveness. We shouldn't say, please forgive me, please forgive me. We, the person that has this language of apology wants you to say, will you please forgive me? And this is important to them because uh, I'm actually not sure why, because this isn't me, but <laughs> uh, it's one of the five languages of apology. They want to be able to see that you actually care about getting the apology. So. so what language do you speak? So here's all five of them. Express regret, accept responsibility, make restitution, change behavior, and request forgiveness. So uh, let's everyone put your hands in the air. Come on. And we'll take a minute here and put your hands down if you know which of these you are, if you know what it is. So, actually, a lot of people, I think, know what there, what there is. So, but think about it, and think about if you have a spouse or a partner, think about what language do they speak, because it's probably different than yours. So, all right. So, what are the next steps? Uh, here are some things to Google, the three main terms, acceptance criteria, user stories, use cases. And I know we ran through this very quickly. Uh, use cases are very complicated, and there's a lot of technical detail and structure around those. So there's a book by Alistair Coburn named Writing Effective Use Cases, and I highly, highly recommend it. And that's my talk, How to Communicate as a Programmer.